West Threat Assessment Center, and he is also the official training partner of GunCon. He's running the shoot house out back. You guys definitely got to check that out. Eric is a very good friend of mine, an amazing guy, longtime friend in the industry. We also have Logan Medish from High Caliber History. Hey, we got some Logan Medish. Good. He brought his family. He is also in a metal band, but won't tell anybody about it for some weird reason. It's a ZZ I don't get Top it. cover band, John. ZZ, ZZ, ZZ top? top cover band. We picked Z. I thought it was Rat. Ah. Uh, buckets. Buckets. All right. <laughs> This young man next to me is Jared Grove from American Outdoor Brands. He represents Lockdown, Frankfurt Arsenal, Caldwell, all this stuff. This guy is one of my favorite people in the industry. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you, fans. I'm standing next to my one of my oldest friends in the industry. This is Joe Haney from LMT Defense. Now, I've got stories for days about the gun that he made me. The first ever custom AR-15 I got in this industry was from this young man right here. This guy believed in me before anybody else, right? And he still does, I hope. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Jerry's out. <laughs> and right here, we've got Tiberius Gibb, YouTuber and barrel salesman. Barrel Gang, what up? How are you? Wonderful. Good, thank you. <laughs> and a surprise guest. Surprise guest, the man, the myth, the legend, that is Eric Pratt of GOA, decided he was going to join us up here. We've got a super wide variety of people. Guys, get up to the microphones on the left and right hand side and ask questions. We've got the live stream out there. By the way, if you're watching live on YouTube right now, I seriously freaking appreciate you. Thank you for being here and listening to this. Guys, I got a question for you. We're going to kick it off on the left hand side. Eric, uh, what do you think is going on in the industry right now? What's the hottest thing that you've seen? You come with a unique perspective. What's the hottest thing in your world, in the defense world, shooting house world? Tell me, tell me about it. I would have to say that the, a lot of the products that are helping you guys conceal carry, um, like our sponsors, Neomag, if you've checked out some of their stuff, getting the gun a lot more concealed um, also, starting to change some of the products so that when it is time to use the gun, if it's a fanny pack, a backpack, that they're more ac accessible. And then giving you guys the opportunity to take those products and go train with them. Um, they're conceptually phenomenal. They're evolving because of the feedback from the training industry, not from the feedback just from the wear. So keep that in mind that the the products that they're putting out need to be validated in a training scenario. So a lot, a lot of EDC focused stuff, that sort of thing. Everybody has decided that defending themselves is legit and they need the good tools, right? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, what do you think, Box? Um, Sorry, Jared. Uh, yeah, yeah. So my nickname is uh, Box or Lunchbox. My mom calls me that. So you all can also refer to me as that. Um, I kind of agree with, with the, what we saw from COVID. Um, a lot of people went out and bought firearms. A lot of people got involved in, the, in other industries too, like fishing, camping. We saw that. Uh, I, so now we, we have all these new firearm owners. The, the group is getting more diverse. Um, it's very exciting. We're, we need to start focusing, or what, what we're focusing on, or what I am, is getting that group exposed to other brands and other, they bought the gun and now it's, getting them the accessories, getting them on the range shooting, um, you know, motivating them to be a gun user, not just a gun owner. Uh, and we see a huge opportunity there with, with these millions of first-time gun buyers, and we want to have, make them have as most positive of experience as possible and, and bring them into the fold. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm seeing the industry right now. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys, uh, if you're out there watching, I want you to uh, pay attention to, yeah, you, sure, the TGC name is up here. But he's also got the Brownells name. Let's give a big round of applause for Brownells for supporting this. <laughs> They're our current live stream sponsor. We really do appreciate that. Uh, honestly, this, this kind of stuff doesn't happen without a lot of people coming together, so I really appreciate it. We've got a question on the left. Go ahead, step up and speak into the microphone. What's your name? Um, all right. Might not be on. Yes, it is. Uh, g'day, my name's Leth, and I uh, just want to say thanks very much for all the work that you do in your various industries. 
Um, there's a lot of change um, in the interest. Get closer to that mic, please. There's Thank a lot you. of change and interest in the, uh, the, the, in the uh, in consumer's focus in all of your industries. What's been the biggest challenge that you've had in um, catering to all the different, the, the constant changing of interest and focus amongst your, your uh, demographics and audiences? Okay. I'm going to throw this one to Eric Pratt first. What's the biggest thing that you've had to overcome with the changing industry? Now, this is coming from a different perspective from a political organization. I'm curious about this. I think what, what we've seen is been very encouraging. And, and by the way, let me just start Thank off you for by the question. also thanking Brownells. Um, on 2A Day this past February, they gave a very generous donation to Gun Owners of America and, and many other uh, gun rights groups that are on the front line. I think one of the, th in, in terms of biggest change that we're seeing is groups and organizations that are seeing what we're doing. And, and okay, I'm, I'm going to kind of come at this from a political point of view, as you said, John. Uh, they see what we're doing in the courts. Uh, the Bruin case was a game changer. We're winning a lot of battles, a lot of court victories. And so people and, and organizations are really stepping up to support gun owners of America, which means that we've now got more attorneys out there in the field bringing cases. We've got more state directors than ever fighting battles in the states. It is, it's really expanded what we've been able to do. That's well, fantastic to hear. Well, Mr. Pratt, Tiberius, what do you think? Well, for me, on the, it's more on the product side. Uh, like, like John said, I work for Roscoe Manufacturing. We make gun barrels. And there's always a new caliber, a new flavor of the month, and it's very expensive to get into new calibers. My example I always use is 224 Valkyrie. Does anybody remember 224 Valkyrie? <laughs> Boo. That was going to be like the <laughs> coolest thing ever, and we spent so much money on T&E, and that round's like gone. Most people didn't even raise their hand that they've ever heard of it, you know, and it was supposed to be the next great thing. You know, and there was just this air of disappointment on stage when you said that. <laughs> I felt everyone down there went, oh. I, I had such a hard time selling barrels. Into, I had to give ammo away with the barrel to convince people to buy the thing. So it was a tough caliber. Yeah, so where you invest in new products going forward and, uh, and R&D for the future when, you know, what next caliber is going to take off and which one's going to die? Hey, Joe, what do you think as I fall off the stage? <laughs> well, so I, I'll, I'll uh, mirror the, the, the comments made before. Um, on, the, uh, on what we do here at LMT, uh, we do some commercial stuff, but a lot of what we do is in the defense sector. So in the defense sector, there's been a huge push for uh, soldier lethality. So making the warfighter more lethal, uh, which in turn blends back into the commercial That's industry. Ideal, right? Everything that we do uh, always trickles back down to the commercial sector and what civilians can have and shoot. And um, being more lethal has been a, a big push. So uh, a focus on night vision capability, uh, you know, being more accurate with that night vision capability, lasers, uh, and then powered rail technology has been a big push in the defense sector and that's something you guys probably haven't seen yet or or maybe you've seen kind of the infancy of it but weapon systems with their own batteries um, that power the rails power the or the, the optic sites that will power lasers flashlights that sort of thing has been a big push um, in that future uh, lethality for soldiers so okay okay check there we go I really appreciate that question. No that is a great question. No worries. Come up here, and I'm going to give you some extra tickets. Just hey, John, off a do little you care chunk. if I talk a little Listen, bit about the change you guys in the didn't get up. Nobody, nobody got up to answer. She's okay. got a question. We're giving out extra tickets for people okay. that ask good questions. That was a great question. Thank hey. you so much. Hey, John. Yeah. You care if I talk a little bit about the training changes? Go ahead. I mean, you brought me up here, right? Yeah. Okay, thanks. I love you. I love you. Love you. Miss you. Mean it. All right. So in 2020, we, we obviously had to shut down for about four months. Uh, we're based in Indiana, um, and we're in Muncie, Indiana, which is a college town. So we've got a lot of diversity. What we saw immediately after our students' diversity base changed quite a bit. A lot more of the folks that, that work 
at the university were concerned with protecting themselves. So what that forced us to do in the training industry is to have a more structured tiered system so that you as gun owners that want to step into the training industry, we have something just from just doing range and then all the way up to validating your training in the shoot house, doing force on force, having an opposed threat. And so those, we really became a lot more robust. We went from about six courses we were teaching to 35. And that's it just was, to keep you guys like engaged. It was throwing gas on the fire. It really was. It, was. it was like throwing gas on the fire because everybody was like suddenly concerned about their safety and learning how to use the thing that, you know, they were scared. And fear drives that stuff a lot of times. I think people realized the, the opportunity for them to actually be engaged in a lethal situation increased tenfold. All right. We'll take another question. This young lady has a, an Instagram following. Boomstick Babe. Check it out. Hi. Oh, Hi. hey. Lottie Dottie. We like the body. No. <laughs> <laughs> wrong mic, wrong time. This question is for uh, Mr. Eric Pratt. I believe your name is. Hi, my name is Alicia Garcia. I'm a Colorado native, and I'm kind of a, a two-way advocate, kind of loudmouth civil rights person. And I just heard you mention that you received a, a hefty good donation from Brownells. That's great. You have more state directors, et cetera, than you've ever had. My experience has been the opposite of that. Um, we do not have a state director for Gun Owners of America in Colorado. As a matter of fact, I believe the person that was doing that job is no longer doing that job and is also divided amongst other states as well. Is this a job application right now? No, is that it what is you're not. Doing? <laughs> <laughs> there, I don't know if I can be afforded. Um, what I'm saying is, is that what is gun owners agenda and plan to pretty much you know get more involvement not within your community as well but in your company and making sure that every state is represented and that you have somebody who's dedicated to a fight in a lot of these states i'm seeing that colorado is really really under attack we're losing battle after battle after battle and there's a lot of people that are very passionate about staying in the fight and making sure that our civil rights are being represented and I want to know from your perspective, what do you guys plan on doing that? And as well as how do you plan on getting the communities and people more involved and more educated in what's happening in their local states and creating so, that? Sense so essentially, of what are you doing to turn up the heat? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, that's a great question. And it's always a process uh, finding good people. Uh, we actually do have somebody who's covering Colorado. You're right. It, it's, uh, he's our uh, Western or the, the Rocky Mountain area director for several states, but he was actually very involved uh, in Colorado fighting the, the assault, wep assault no, weapons not, ban sir. recently. I, I hate to break it to you, but he wasn't. And I also believe that his wife is also in politics in Colorado Springs. So I've been to every single one of these meetings at the legislation, and he has not represented himself or Gun Owners of America at all. I think actually the last person that showed up from Gun Owners of America was uh, the barefoot defender for the assault weapons ban, so. Actually, he was very involved. Um, we can talk afterwards offline, uh, and, and I can go through all, all what he was doing. I mean, I, I don't wanna have a, a spitting contest here. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's, you know, again, uh, if. If you're offering a job application, as, as John was saying, no, we, we, we are looking for people that can uh, be in a particular state, but right now we have coverage with all 50 states, and you know the other lobbying groups do that as well. They don't always have one, one person per state. Uh, it's not necessarily efficient, but as the budget grows, then we're able to bring more people on. Uh, so that's the exciting thing, and we're rallying more people than ever. We, you know, we did a, a, a joint letter to the Congress recently with the, the 2A industry and the 2A influencers. Uh, John was on it, uh, Jared of uh, Guns and Gadgets. I mean, this is rallying millions of viewers. Uh, you know, in the House of Representatives, for example, they, I speak with the leadership, they told us, that bill to repeal Biden's gun ban, we don't have the votes to pass it. And let me tell you, these YouTubers that are in here generating the grassroots, man, we had thousands upon thousands of calls coming into those 
borderline uh, congressional districts, and by a whisker, we got that repeal passed. Uh, we failed by a whisker in the Senate, uh, which was unfortunate, but either way, now this is sending a strong message to the courts that, hey, uh, Congress would not have passed this Biden gun ban. He circumvented Congress, banned four, up to 40 million pistol braces, and by sending that message that the House of Representatives voted this down, that sends a strong message to the courts that this was completely inappropriate. That's the kind, you know, when, to, so to answer your question about how are we trying to grow the message, it's we realize we can't do it all alone. We have to partner with those who've got the loud soapboxes, and, and that's how we're really spreading the message at the national level and in the states. Yeah, I, I mean, it may not be publicly obvious, but they are doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make their message a lot louder. Let's go to a question up here. Come get some tickets. Grab yourself some tickets. First, you got a question? You got a question on the left. Yeah, I guess it's working. Uh, first of all, I want to thank every one of you guys on the industry panel. Uh, Eric, I would like to thank you personally for the GOA stuff that you've done with the pistol braces. Um, but my question simply boils down to one thing. The big, bad, evil AR-15, how do we change this perception from being just a semi-automatic rifle like in the 1022? Is there any way the industry can nationally start showing that the AR is nothing more than just a single shot semi-automatic rifle? You know what? I'm going to throw this one to Logan. Uh, have we ever been able to change the perception? As, as somebody that's focused on history of firearms, have we ever been able to shift that around? No, uh, I, I don't think we have. And it's really unfortunate, especially when you consider that when Colt introduced the AR to the civilian market in 1963, um, because remember, the military didn't want it, and so Colt sent it to the civilian market first. They took out ads in all of the gun magazines at that time, uh, American Rifleman, Gun Digest, and all that, big full-page ads uh, for the Colt Sporter and touting it as your next hunting rifle. That's interesting. And, and that was how that gun was presented to the public for the first time in the, in the first major uh, ad campaign for the AR-15. It was listed as the Colt Sporter, and, and you were going to take that gun hunting. Um, and that's how the world was introduced to that semi-automatic rifle. And it has just, for lack of a better term, it, it has just gotten out of control yeah. from the other side. Um, so it, it's certainly not been for lack of trying, even from day one. I think, I think people have a deep emotional connection to whatever they believe when it comes to firearms. So what you're, what you're asking is, can we change the perception and, and the emotional connection that millions and millions of people have based on primarily fear? And I don't think it is possible or likely to have that many people simultaneously overcome their mostly irrational fear of an inanimate object. Well, I just, I John, just can I add one thing? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is show how these firearms are so extremely useful in self-defense, loved by women. And uh, if you go over to our table here, Stephen Williford, if any of you haven't heard his story, uh, you need to go over and talk to him. Uh, he was the barefoot defender who stopped the mass shooting at Sutherland Springs, Texas in 2019. And he's just- Round of applause yeah, for that, that young that man. That deserves. Steven, put your hand up. Put your hand up. Thank you. And so he's just published a book which tells his story. He'd love to autograph it for you. But one of the things that we've been able to do is get him on a lot of television, a lot of podcasts where he just, I don't know if he gets sick of telling that story, but he's telling the story over and over. But it's a powerful way of showing, you know, any tool can be used for evil or for good. And he used it for good to save people's lives. And so I, I think that's, that's one powerful way of trying to change that narrative. One other quick thing I'd like to add as well, it's, it's the fear of the unknown. You know, anybody who shot an AR-15 knows it's not a scary, like my 10-year-old can shoot an AR-15. But the people who don't know, who are uneducated on that, are afraid of it. So 
anybody you know who is it, does not like guns, take them shooting. Especially even better if there's a 15, 22 out there, let them shoot a, a, a gun and get rid of the fear of the unknown. I've done it to so many people. Guns are bad. They go shooting and they're like, well, that's kind of fun. And uh, I think that's a very effective way. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Hey, Orly, do we have any questions from our live online audience? By the way, shout out to everybody that's out there watching now. We're going to wave to you. Hello, there's a couple cameras here. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We know you couldn't be here, but we love you for tuning in. Orly, go ahead with that question. Yeah, we got a, we got a few questions uh, from the chat here. Uh, Big Chimpin asking, just a simple one, uh, are there any affordable battle rifles? 308, 6.5 Creedmoor in the works you all know about. Affordable. Let's go to LMT Defense. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, I mean, there is. It comes down to what, uh, what firearms are tools, right? You know, you can go out and get Harbor Freight, you know, wrenches and, and stuff, and you can work on your car, and they'll do the job, right? But are you a career shooter? Are you a career mechanic? You're gonna go buy Snap-on, you're gonna buy some Milwaukee stuff, you know? There are firearms out there to meet every budget, you know, and I'm not gonna sit up here, I, you know, I'll pull this off, and you know, you can go buy an arrow, and you can get the job done, you know? Buy the firearm that's gonna meet your budget, and like Tiberius is saying, you know, the fear of unknown, take, if you got X amount of money, and you want a battle rifle, 308 or 65 battle rifle, buy whatever's in your means, then go get training. Please go get training with that weapon system. Buy some ammo, buy a decent optic, and um, put that to use. Uh, don't go out and say, all right, I got you know, $2,500 to, to buy a weapon system and spend $2,495 on it, and then you have no sight, you have no ammo, you have no experience with it. So. There's a lot of weapon systems, but it all comes down to what you uh, want to do with it and uh, how far you want to take that. So. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Okay. Thank you for that question. Orly, we got another one from the online audience. That we do. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jay Weth is asking, I uh, guess for the whole panel, uh, what have you seen that shows the public the fun, positive side of the 2A community? And how can we continue to spread the positive nature of our industry? All right, we're going to start with Jared with that one. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, so I think it's uh, one of the biggest changes that I see and that we're seeing here is just the fact that, that that question came in online. We're seeing people, technology is expanding our, our voice, our reach. Um, you know, we, we, <laughs> we found ways, one of uh, the brands, and come see me in a little bit for reloading. Reloading is, a, is an older demographic, if you look at it. But when we started launching and looking at marketing, uh, we found that we can do Facebook groups and Facebook Lives, and people loved it and came in. So it's great to spread that message, and, and uh, what we're looking at is finding these new ways. Um, they say Gun Con, come to Gun Con, watch Gun Con Live. Um, it, it's awesome. This never would have happened 10 years ago. Um, you know, we, we used it as a platform to share pictures while we were on vacation, and now we can use it way more powerful uh, through influencers. These guys that are here, millions and millions and millions of impressions, and that is such a powerful tool that, and, and it's crazy, like you meet them, and it's one of those things, like they say, don't meet your hero. Uh, very, very rarely have I met some of these YouTube guys, and they aren't just as genuine in person, and they, I mean, they, they're legit, man. They care about uh, the, the 2A community, um, they care about their fans. Like they realize that some of them, they can be really humble and understand that without you fans, they're nothing. Um, so it's great. I love. Uh, I think that's the biggest change and, and one of our, our biggest, most powerful tools that we'll be able to use is, as our voice is is these uh, influencers or our platforms and things like this. You know, one of the other things that I think is really cool is that people have realized. Like we got a couple younger folks. Raise y'all hand. Thank you. We got a couple younger folks here today, and uh, I appreciate that uh, parents are going, you know what, I don't want the schools, the, the people outside of my home to be pushing their agenda on my children, and they're starting to educate at even younger ages and showing them the, uh, the wonderful side of this community and what we all come together about, firearms, hunting, being outside.
being self-sufficient, all of those things. And it's wonderful to see young guys in the front row, high five, love you guys. And uh, I, I think it's really cool to see the industry accepting that and pushing that forward, right? Yeah. You guys are the next generation, so whatever we can do to bolster your influence in the market, the industry, you know, uh, whether you want to come work for a company like ours, we're here to educate and promote that enthusiasm. Yeah, thank you, Joe. John, I'll add to that real quick. Yeah, please. So <clears throat> structured training is starting to be a thing. So I don't know if Friends of America, does everybody have chapters in their area of that? It's basically a 2A group. They just go shooting together. They start inviting somebody that, that has never done that into the fold, and then our local chapter has come and said, hey, we want some instruction. So that brings it in. But when we talk about the youth, for us, we just host Nerf Wars in our shoot house. That's, that's an actual thing. I want everybody to hear that one more time. We host Nerf Wars in our military grade shoot I'm a 39-year-old man, and I want to do that. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. It gets the youth uh, used to being in a shoe house. Uh, they ask a lot of good questions, uh, and then later in life, they won't be so intimidated about coming in and, and doing it for real. Do you hear him talking smack over here? Oh. Lean it, say that in the microphone. John would be the first one out, just <laughs> no doubt. Have you seen this beard here? It's got, like, Kevlar woven in it. He's, he's definitely last into the last round. You see the size of the people that he'd be fighting. Yeah. Faster, way better faster hand eye coordination. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you're done. I think we have a new idea. <laughs> we need to live stream it and sell pay per view. It's going to happen. We can make that happen. Yeah. We should do that. Let's do it. Yeah, we should do that. Have, a, have a, an army of children against me. John versus the sixth grade. <laughs> He's already done that once. Grader? What? He said John versus the sixth grade. I was like, well, haven't you already done that once? Twice. <laughs> twice. <laughs> twice, twice, yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, if, if you guys are out there watching live real quick, I want to give a big shout out to Blackout Coffee. Now, Blackout Coffee provided all of the coffee here today. Everybody in the audience got some. It's really good. Raise your hand if you like Blackout Coffee. Look at that. Every That's hand going up. It's amazing. Now, I want you to go to blackoutcoffee.com slash TGC. Hey, Jared, is there a promo code for? Okay. Use the code TGC and get yourself a little discount. Get the Tenacity blend. Get the 2A blend from Jared. And GOA's got a blend. They make some amazing coffee, teas, all that stuff. Go check it out, blackoutcoffee.com slash TGC. Thank you so much. Let's, uh, let's take the question on the right here. Go ahead. Speak into the microphone. Hey, so I, um, I'm going to veer off from the political side. Get a little closer. Thank you. And uh, go more to products. There's a lot of really interesting stuff that I've seen and been excited by, like the smart guns, even novel things like faster twist weights, twist rates for 8.6, creating wider expansion, like cool stuff like that. The powered rails that you were talking about that I like have sketches of five years ago, how to make that work. Um, so are there any, for your individual kind of areas, cool stuff that you're excited about that you've either seen or maybe you know is on the horizon um, that is exciting for us to like geek out on? Okay, uh, we're gonna get everybody on that one because I think that's a great question. Uh, Eric, do you want to start? What's the... Uh, you're you're going to pass on that? Okay, so Eric says machine guns for everybody. That's the most exciting thing. <laughs> We're dismantling oh, yeah. the NFA, right? I got you, brother. Amen, brother. Go ahead, Tiberius. So at, uh, at Roscoe, we have a lot of new products coming out, some new pistol barrels, a bunch of new rifle barrels. I think I'm most excited about 6mm arc. We started testing 6mm arc, and if any of you folks haven't heard of it, it's a... Uh, uh, a great round with great ballistics that um, has a lot of promise. Um, so there's a ton of, of new products coming out. Um, you know what's really interesting is there's a lot less hype than there was with Valkyrie, but that cartridge seems to be sticking more. Keep going. Now that was it. <laughs> okay, great. Joe? <laughs> ammo, uh, ammo technology has gotten a lot better than it had generations before. So uh, when you're talking about the expansion, you know, if you rewind the clock, you know, 30 years ago, 
you couldn't spin a 150 grain bullet like with a one in three twist rate. It would just completely come apart. And with the manufacturers and, and new technologies, uh, new new ways to manufacture bullets or or even barrels and stuff like that, we're able to push uh, materials to their to their extreme limits. So ammo, I mean, ARs and and handguns and stuff like that are they're generally going to be the same for a while until we revolutionize some sort of new material or way to ignite a primer. Um, but the materials and how we interface with them is leaps and bounds what it was 10 years ago even. I, I mean, you look at what these guys are doing with barrels and uh, what manufacturers are doing with bullets and whether they're bonded or, or you know, certain jackets and stuff like that. That's big right now. I will, I will wrap it up. Jared, can you jump in next? Yeah. What's some new interesting stuff? Um, so, so I'm going to do two. Okay. Uh, so American Outdoor Brands has 20-something brands. I'll talk about two of them. First one, Caldwell Shooting Supplies. Um, we're doing some great stuff over there. I'm really excited about uh, one of the big industries. I mean, we were known for our shooting rest, the lead sled. You know, the, it's super, super popular, really built the brand. But we've expanded out into um, – Shotgun shooting, so we, we made our first clay uh, target thrower. Um, bringing innovation into products and, and stuff that hadn't been done. You know, everybody knows what, how an electric thrower works. It's great, but you have to drag a battery and stuff. So we're taking those pain points and being like, how can we make a clay thrower work like an electric thrower but use no batteries? Well, we designed that. We launched it. It's over there. Go tell Trent to give you a demo. Uh, if you're online, check it out on, <laughs> on YouTube or wherever, a lot of them out there. So expanding that out, expanding out AR-500 steel. Everybody loves shooting steel targets. The growth in, in firearms and ammunition, the 6 arc, the PRCs, getting that long range stuff out there and nobody wants to go down range and, and change paper. So you put steel up. We come up with, with fun stuff to, for accessories for steel, uh, hit indicators that flash green lights at you uh, at, and you, at over you can a mile. see those things from so far away a long way is gavin still standing back here gavin I, there hey, he there's is. gavin we we just did a shoot at gavin's place and we used these hit indicators what what was it 1200 yards 1280 almost 1300 at uh, rock rock chunk olympics the videos will be on ultimate reloader check that out yeah yeah rock chunk olympics we used them one of the first debuts of the flashbang hit indicator in use uh, it's just fun stuff like that that we've identified. And then my other, one of my passions um, is Frankfurt Arsenal reloading. I've been a reloader for a long time. Started out because I, you know, I bought a 1911, loved to shoot it, couldn't afford to feed it, so I had to learn how to make my own. Um, so when I started with American Outdoor Brands five years ago, uh, that was one of the brands that I was assigned to as a brand manager. And uh, I got to work with a friend of mine from college who's an amazing engineer and also a very much uh, high volume reloader. And, and we said, went to our bosses, said we want to make a progressive reloading press. They said, sure, go for it. So uh, stop by and see it. I have progressive reloading machine that's 10 stations, run a thousand rounds an hour at a price point that the common person can afford. It's not a $5,000 machine that, that's, you know, that's just not obtainable. But then we were also making reloading kits for beginners and getting that voice, that, that message out to the people that haven't reloaded and saying it's not scary, it's very easy, buy this whole kit. So we have some really cool stuff in that. Really, the theme is that you're, you're trying to make it easier for people to shoot. Very much so. Okay. Logan, so anything two, new and interesting? Yeah. Two things that you wouldn't think go together, flintlock rifles and CNC machining. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, but there is a company in Ohio, uh, Jim Kibler Long Rifles, and he has spent years and has finally perfected uh, putting together uh, kit rifles that, you know, you can finish out. And he's rough building them and, and turning the stocks on CNC machines. He has designed and made his own lock, uh, all designed with the CNC machine to give the tightest tolerances, uh, the most repeatable ignition with your flint against the steel, you know, perfecting the geometry uh, of the frizzing on that. And then the coolest thing I think that he just did, because I have absolutely zero artistic ability whatsoever, uh, that's why I'm a historian and not an artist, uh, <laughs> he has found a way to use the CNC machines when they're working on the stocks, 
to put historic, like 18th century carving and scroll work and stuff into the stocks from the factory so that you know you can have a, a golden era of the flintlock rifles with the gorgeous carving on it. Um, and it's, it, it doesn't look, you know, it's not like with laser engraving and stuff and it doesn't look like, in, you know, engraving. This is, this carving is really well done uh, and, and it looks, it's legit. It's really, really cool. And so you can, you know, you can take a really awesome piece of extra fancy curly maple and have this CNC uh, well. carving in there. It's, it's really cool and have one of the tightest tolerances on the locks that, you know, it's going to go What was the name bang. of that company again? It's uh, Kibler Long Rifles. Okay. Check out Kibler Long Rifles. Eric, what do you think, bud? One of the ch biggest challenges we have in training, especially what we do in the shoe house, is reducing the, the cost on the training ammunition. It's a little over a dollar a round right now. So if you get into a class that's 500, 600 rounds, you can automatically see on top of your hotel bill that's going to be a very expensive class, while maintaining functionality of the weapon system and accuracy. And so... As much as the video game like things you're starting to see a lot like at SHOT Show are kind of what we consider the diet pill of training, they are inducing some really good capabilities out there. So pretty soon, and it'll start in the law enforcement military side, you're going to be able to, we're going to be able to replicate <coughs> the feeling of actually being shot, put on the oh, ground, okay. and you'd have to fight through it without actually getting shot. It'll be super accurate, and the gun will be, uh, your gun will work with the system. That's really, really interesting. Honestly, the, the diversity in the answers is kind of amazing. Thank you for the question. Come up and get some tickets. Will that be Nerf compatible? 100%. That's where we're starting with it. Okay. With the army. Right. I hope it hurts really bad when they Feeling shoot like you. they're shot. They're pulling. That's good. No, you just take it there you and go. amplify it 100 Thank you so much. Honestly, guys, thank you for all of these questions. This is, this is great. On the left, what's your name? Uh, hi, my name is William. Hi, William. Thank you for being here. Iowa State. Yep. Go team. <laughs> what's your question? Uh, so with regard to the military's recent adoption of the spear rifle, uh, and the rifle being almost 13 pounds, not including the ammunition, do you feel like the military is leaning back on lessons that we should have learned back in the Vietnam War? Uh, I think there's one person that knows that military space very, very well, sitting to my right. So y your question was, uh, are we repeating some of the same mistakes? Uh, I think that there, it could go either way. Um, what we're looking at it, when we build weapon systems that are heavier and bigger uh, is, is not necessarily... Are we making the weapon system heavier for the user? It's what more lethality are we giving the user? So that weapon system wasn't built around uh, like a frame. You know, it wasn't like, let's, uh, let's start with the skeleton of a weapon and then build it from there. That, the genesis of that was the caliber. You know, the 6.8 uh, bullet that they wanted was to um, defeat near peer body armor at extreme distance. So that, when you take a look at that, it goes back to what uh, the previous gentleman asked about, what, and I said ammo. That round was specifically developed for high pressure. <laughs> that high pressure needs to be contained a certain way. That is where we built the, the gun up from there, and then it got heavy. So you're going to see some, uh, some improvements with that, I think, you know, whether it's the spear or any other weapon system. Is, uh, how does that do in real-world application? and what alternatives or changes are made to it later on. Great question. Come up and get some tickets. You want to set them up with some tickets, Joe? Thank you. Hey, uh, guys, it is getting a little rowdy outside. Just be aware, you know, if you hear some thunder and stuff, no big deal. Yeah. We're in an amazing place all huddled together. This is one of the safest places we can be in America. And I'm not talking about the fact that there's a tornado shel uh, shelter behind me. I'm talking about you guys are all hopefully armed. Okay. Uh, before I push too much farther, I want to get again say a thank you to Brownells for supporting this. Where's is anybody from Brownells that works there? Uh, I can't see everybody's milling around. Doesn't matter. Thank you to the Brownells family for supporting this event.
and making this come together. We could not do this without them. Thank you to them, for sure. And I believe, uh, hey, Orly, do we have a promo code for, for uh, GunCon with Brownells? I think it's GunCon23? I may be off. Yeah, uh, we got a product code right here. Gun Speak Con. closer to the mic, please. GunCon23. GunCon23 is a promo off. code. 20, $20 off? $200. There you go. $20 off, $200. GunCon23, Brown Else promo code. Okay, uh, let's grab one more question off the uh, live audience. Orly, give me a question if you've got one. Yeah, we got some questions here. Uh, the chat is going off. Everybody, uh, thank you for the questions. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys watching live. It's amazing to see so many people supporting this. Go ahead. Uh, John Boudreau asked, do you believe the Made in Texas suppressor law will change the 2A landscape if found constitutional? No, because other states have to step up and be just as good. Great question. Thank you so much. On the right, speak into the mic, and what's your name? Uh, my name is Zach. Uh, Hi, Zach. I have worked in the uh, federal court system for over 17 years now, and I know there was some discussion earlier about Bruin. Um, I've seen more challenges to the, uh, the, 920, the 18 922, the felon in possession, drug user in possession statutes than I have in my entire time in, in working in the courts. I'm just curious from a political perspective or a historical perspective where uh, folks see these, these potential challenges going in the future. So, yes, uh, felon in possession, especially nonviolent felon in possession, we're seeing uh, courts ruling against that law saying that, or the, uh, that particular federal law saying that there's no historical equivalent uh, when the Constitution was made. Uh, like I was, you know, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Bruin has really opened the door uh, you know, it's interesting, when, uh, when Heller was being argued, we, uh, we were involved with an amicus brief where we actually argued for text and history. USA Today called us up and said, we want to do an interview with you because your, yours is the only brief that's arguing for text history shall not be infringed. Well, we were so pleased to see the court use that and that, you know, I mean, and it's been slow going because a lot of courts were resistant to using that and they came up with these uh, bogus two-step approaches, et cetera, et cetera. But now with Bruin, I mean, they've made it abundantly clear if you can't go back and show historically that in the text and history or that there was such a law at the time of the founding, then it is unconstitutional. And so we're seeing district judges all over the country uh, adopting that. Uh, the ones you reference, uh, uh, you know, we've been successful in, in New York with uh, challenging the, uh, the concealed carry law. Uh, it's now on appeal, obviously. Um, we, uh, in, in Illinois, same thing with the semi-auto ban there. Uh, and in Texas, uh, where uh, the, our judge and other judges, too, in Texas, uh, federal judges, ruled against Biden's uh, gun ban on uh, 40, up to 40 million uh, pistols. So, yeah, there's just been an explosion. Obviously, there's still some liberal judges that are resistant to this, but I, I think progress is being made. There's been a very strong beachhead laid, and it's just a matter of, you know, we're, we're going to keep filing cases and forcing these judges to submit. You know, I think, I think the influx of new gun owners and a lot of people going, wait, what's happening? A lot of people realizing how bad it was, and I think they're jumping in the fight, and that's a great thing. Great question. Come up and get some tickets, brother. Appreciate it. Let's go to the left side. Speaking to the microphone, what's your name? Um, Todd. Todd. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. He's got a gun con shirt on. That means he was here last year as well. Thanks for coming back. Gun What's your question? Uh, I got a question. I got a two part one, I guess, if I can. Uh, Eric. Let's, let's keep it tight. Let's okay. keep it tight. Eric, uh, thank you for everything you do. And, uh, well, I wanted to bring up a bunch of things, but the uh, credit card 
thing that was uh, brought up in the news recently that the credit cards were supposedly volunteering information to the ATF for gun purchases. And I just read that that's been backed down, but I you know, believe that, so, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that, that's the information I have, too, that they're backing off on that. Okay. Uh, and you could probably thank a lot of the states that are passing laws uh, that you know basically nullifying that in their states so uh, so right now I think we're at a better place than we were before okay. that's and fantastic uh, come up here and get some tickets brother okay. we got to keep it rolling we're actually blowing through time there's been so many good questions guys we really genuinely do appreciate it rip yourself some off there right there tear it off now, I'm sorry that we, we don't have anything for the live audience watching except for amazing promo codes with a company like Blackout Coffee. Blackoutcoffee.com slash TGC. Use our code TGC. Get yourself a discount. Get some amazing coffee. We genuinely appreciate it. We all love it. There's a reason that we all love it because it's good. Go buy some. Code is TGC. Uh, let's go over here to the right. Speaking of the microphone, what's your name? Wait, my name is Mike. Mike. Yeah. Thanks for being here, ask, brother. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about, with not getting into the brace stuff, but with braces under the, under the gun right now, people trying to get rid of that, I kind of see that as one of the ma major improvements the industry has made toward helping people with handicaps shoot firearms and get into firearms lifestyle and self-defense. I'm curious if you guys know of anything going on in the industry that you're excited about for disabled people other than the braces that they could be looking into to improve their ability to carry and use a gun? You know, I think, I think the brace thing scared the crap out of a lot of people from innovating. Uh, I would love to see, and I'm sure these guys would agree, we would love to see more companies taking risks and, and innovating in that space. And it's very difficult to do that when the threat of, you know, big bad ATF is like, hey, you know, this could be legal, you could make millions of dollars, and then we're going to strip it from everybody and crush the industry in half. Yeah. That's a problem. So I think that scares people from innovating. What do you guys think? Anybody want to jump in on that? Any new interesting uh, stuff for like, I th disabled people? I think companies like Caldwell are going to be the, the, better, the better folks. I, obviously, you know, you're not looking at hand-fired systems, but, you know, for the true disabled people that need to get out there and, and you know, continue to shoot and stuff like that, being able to better support that weapon system or, um, you know, if they're on a, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, a device where they, they need mobility and stuff like that, brands like Caldwell are really going to be able to, to stand out and, and innovate and get better ways to shoot. So, Do you guys have it? Do you ever have conversations like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and if you uh, – so, so Caldwell had a product called FieldPod. And it was a gun rest that wasn't just maybe for people with a handicap, but it was very adaptable to helping people that had uh, were perhaps paralyzed. I have a friend um, that was paralyzed when he was 18 in a float accident, and uh, I take him to the range. And, and yeah, you, you uh, number one, the, that community is very adaptive, very resourceful, um, and we can help them with stuff like that. What ends up helping is everybody else that doesn't have a disability, it helps us shoot better. Uh, you know, um, not talking about braces necessarily, but like in shooting rest. So yeah, we have um, field pods. We moved to our hunting brand called BOG, uh, B-O-G, and we came out with a, a new type of field rest called the death grip. And there's, oh man, there's like three or four different generations of death grips now, but check them out. They're all over the place but it holds the rifle steady for you and, and takes some of that upper body strength requirement out. We see a lot of that. I'll say also not on, on a product side as much, but as, a, as somebody that shoots a, a competitive, competitively a lot more than I hunt, um, I'm seeing a lot of the disciplines becoming more adaptable to letting somebody that, if you do have a disability of, of changing and, and adapting to, the, to those needs, to make sure that they can come and have fun with us as well. And it's really, it's really awesome. I mean, I've shot USPSA with uh, guys in electric wheelchairs and stuff. And, you know, it's, you, you figure it out. And uh, 
I think we can all do a better job of inviting those people and not seeing, oh, there's a disability. Well, they have a disability, but they're still able. Bring them out. You know, my friend shoots a, <laughs> shoots a gun, um, and we had to make a special bolt and stuff for him, but he can definitely do it. That's awesome, man. I, I love seeing companies understanding who their actual audience is because it's not just a rubber stamp anymore. Okay. In, in years past, that may have worked, but that is far gone. Mike, why don't you come up here and grab some extra tickets, brother? I appreciate you. Yeah, I, I'm making the guy with the cane walk up here. Ms. Shinzing, <laughs> go ahead. Hold on, hold on. The mic's not on. How about now? Oh, hey, there we go. There we okay. Go. There we go. Hello, so I'm over here wondering what I, as a friend, as a family member, can be doing to inspire confidence in the people around me when it comes to firearms. So what have you seen that inspires people when it comes to firearms, whether they're going from, oh, what if somebody takes the gun away from me, or, oh, I can't handle a gun, I can't handle a situation. What have you seen inspires people from going from that space into confidence you know eric's got uh some really interesting courses that are right in line with that do you want to speak on that one yeah that, yeah absolutely thank you um it, it does come down to training the exposure right you have to look at it like as as many times as you can get in that situation the more you'll rely on your training than panic right so we can't always train the mentality but we can put you in the scenario so many times and get you enough repetitions that you are now task oriented and you're used to it. If you start thinking about the first time, you know, okay, we talk about a lot of times about driving home. You don't have to look at the street signs. You don't have to look at the stop sign. You know where to stop, you know where to turn. We can, we can put you in the scenarios so many times that that just becomes the neuro pathway gets developed and it's, for lack of a better term, muscle memory. And what that does, even in the very first class, that familiarity and being in a group of peers starts making you a lot more confident. And then as you train and you understand the tactics and the techniques to make you successful and you've now performed those many times, obviously the confidence comes in play there. Yeah, and you know that when you when you hear training, sometimes it can sound really serious. But the stuff they do is some of the most fun you can have with a gun. And I think it's just about building that camaraderie around it, and that that really takes the walls down. You know, it really does. It really does. Anybody else got anything to add to that one? Okay, cool. Let's move on. On the right, come up here and get some tickets. By the way, on the right, what's your name, man? Stephen. Stephen, uh, thanks for being here, the, brother. Oh, thank you. How has the growth of grappling martial arts affected uh, training, dealing with people who might have some or using it to defend yourself? So, uh, is, can you say that one more time? I couldn't, I couldn't hear very well. You said martial arts? Uh, like grappling martial arts that um, work well with firearms and defending yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm one of the, the fattest people in this building. I have no idea. Anybody got any idea on martial arts being well, used with firearms? Absolutely. It's our, it's our defensive tactics, right? It's our open hand techniques. I mean, a lot of us have carried a lot of years and haven't used a gun to protect ourselves. You may have to use your hands and your knowledge first. What I want to say is where I've seen the biggest changes in law enforcement, and I'm proud of that. I'm, I'm a, an officer. I've been... Uh, in law enforcement in the last 16 years, most of my time in SWAT, but we have changed over these wrist locks and arm locks into jiu-jitsu. And it keeps us safer, and it keeps, believe it or not, the suspects safer hmm. because we're a lot more knowledgeable. We understand what, the mo the, uh, what we're doing a little bit more on the ground. And, I've, and we've had some recent events that have shown a lack of training and have helped drive that. Not only that, but the fact that our citizenship is now becoming a lot more educated on it drives it a lot more too. Um, what we do find out in our training scenarios is that the martial arts community has way better de-escalation techniques verbally than anybody else. Okay. And I think that's just a, a direct reflection of the training and the confidence that you guys have. Awesome, thank you so much, man. Great question, come up and grab yourself a couple tickets. We're going to take one more. Yeah, we're, we're blowing through time. I appreciate all the questions, guys. You guys have been amazing. Thank you for that question. Go ahead. What's your name? Uh, Kyle. Kyle, thanks for being here. What's your question? Uh, it's actually from my uncle. He's overseas in Jordan right now. Okay, what's your uncle's name? Corey Strohmeyer. Corey 
Thank you. If, if you're watching, Corey, you we really service. appreciate it. Okay. We really appreciate the support. This is amazing. Thank you so much. His question is, why, is there, uh, why isn't there more schools like SDI or the modern gunsmithing schools or more in-person schools across the nation like the one in Colorado? Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. So the, basically, why aren't there more educational schools within the firearms community, industry, et cetera? You, you guys, anybody want to jump in on that? I don't, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, is, it, is it just firearms? I mean, if you look, we're losing, we're losing tradesmen yeah. uh, all over. That's a yeah, great point. Um, that's a great point. I think, I think you'll, you'll see that, and there's, there's some people out there that are trying to turn that around, but the gunsmithing and gun industry is not uh, immune from it. We do have the MGS, guys. Yeah. That, Shout out to MGS. Help, They're here sponsor and a sponsor. This, yes. Um, so there are some out there. It, it, yeah, it's not like a, a college, though, that... I would love to see that change, but I, I don't know the cause of it. Well, and that's uh, from the manufacturing side. We get a lot of um, younger folks, uh, we'll, we'll call it that, that are focusing on uh, programming, CNC, and, and, and the manufacturing in a different way. You got to look, the, the generation of gunsmiths came from a generation of people who used manual machines, manual lathes, manual, CN or manual mills. And then they took their passion for machining and turned it into a, a, a profession as a gunsmith. Those manual machines are gone. I, I mean, we still use them, you know. In Gavin, Gavin has them all. Yeah, he, he bought all of them probably. <laughs> uh, we still use them, but the, 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 the community has changed. We love to see more of it, and there are a lot of schools and stuff like that that are promoting that. You just got to target the audience, and, and perhaps the schools could do more to target those audiences. So I actually sat down with Zeke from MGS uh, not that long ago. It's, uh, we've got a podcast. We sat down for about an hour and talked about all this sort of stuff. So uh, subscribe to the TGC podcast on whatever podcasting thing, uh, and wait on that one because that's going to be a great discussion where we get through – uh, a lot of things like that and what they're doing to push and change the game for that that sort of side of things. Thanks for that question. Come up here and get yourself some tickets, brother. We appreciate it. Apparently, Grinnell College here in Iowa has some, some gunsmithing stuff. Yeah, just, just rip off a bunch, dude. Look, you're being encouraged to take it, yeah. That is the last question. Uh, I really genuinely do appreciate all of you being here. This is an absolutely amazing thing. Uh, and this was the first ever industry panel. Did you guys have a good time? Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank all of you for being up here with me. This has been awesome. I think we've got an amazing group of folks. And uh, if you guys want, we'll do it again next year. Everybody out there watching live, thank you so much. We really do appreciate it. Check out Brownells. Use that promo code, Blackout Coffee as well. And of course, thank you all for watching. We'll see you very soon. Thanks, guys.